which is very closely related to how the chakras relate to karma and reincarnation. Karma being the operative word. Um, I've recently uh, traveled and been teaching in India. This is being recorded in uh, March of 2014. And for January and February, I was traveling in India. So the um, experience of the cultural orientation there um, is very vivid in my mind. And the question of karma and how it affects us, what it is, and what we can do about it um, is, is uh, absolutely central to our understanding of the spiritual path. And the understanding of karma is absolutely intertwined, inescapably intertwined with the chakras. So in many ways, above all, that's the point I want to get across. <clears throat> and then the individual qualities of each chakra especially as those qualities relate to the way we manifest in the world and the way we manifest in the world being an indication of what our inner energy is like. You see, we can, we can come at it from both sides. We can, we can watch ourselves behave and that tells us who we are. We can feel who we are inside and then we can learn to manifest our inner reality. And that whole aspect of things I really want to talk about and then, of course, um, the most important, perhaps, once all the understandings are in place, is what can we do about it? Um, how, can we, um, how can we actually use the, facts of, the fact of the chakras to overcome and change karma and to hasten our development? Because I started by saying that the problem that everyone brings to me is the gap between aspiration and accomplishment. So... Now I'm going <clears> to <throat> just start laying out some basic principles here. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Every, um, okay, I'll start. There are many aspects of the chakras, and so sometimes what we do sometimes, what I do sometimes, is I will sort of use a certain image in talking about the chakras. It might not be completely like infallibly, infallibly accurate all the way up to the infinite, but nonetheless gives us a practical grasp of what we're trying to understand. So let's think of it like this. I'm going to just draw a line here as if this, I'll just draw a little stick figure because that works just as well. Okay, so this is our stick figure again. And this is our, these are our chakras. Here's our happy yogi. Okay, and here's his heart there. All right. Um, when we talk about the, the lowest chakra, we're talking about the earth element. And when we t talk about the earth element, we're talking about a commitment to the concept of matter. Okay. And the, the quality of matter is that things are separate from one another. I have two of these markers here and you, you sort of, no matter how hard you try, you can't get them to go together because matter, um, reality gets fixed. And so we see all this separateness <clears throat> in a, a spiritual sense, in a personal sense. When we're focused on the quality of earth, when we're committed all the way to earth, the separateness that matter represents is most strongly manifested in our concept of ourselves. You know, it's, it's easy to look around and feel that I am a separate entity. I'm separate from the other people that I know. I'm separate from the furniture in the room. I'm separate from the trees outside. I'm certainly separated from God. It's the most obvious uh, self-definition is separate individuality. So when we, what the uh, earth element represents is this idea that I am my own entity. I make my own decisions and what's good for me, is good. Um, in America, there was a book that was actually a best-selling book for many years, and it was called Looking Out for Number One. <laughs> number one is myself. I am number one in the universe, and I look out for myself, and when I look out for myself, that's a wise way to behave. Extreme examples of this are people who will steal uh, from other people, who will lie, who will do violence to others, who will even murder other people, who will use their 
children to serve their own cause without any thought about the child's welfare or the husband's welfare, the wife's welfare. It's all about me. It's an absolute commitment to ego. Ego being the jiva, the infinite spirit, the spark of divinity that animates us, completely identified with the physical body and the physical world. Whatever I can get for myself in the physical world is good. And that, in a, in a very um, uh, simplistic way, is what the earth element, the earth chakra represents, separateness. Now, at the exact opposite pole, you have the spiritual eye. I realize I don't have to use my crummy charts. I can just point over here. You know, you have the spiritual eye. If you want to read it, Ashra, I might not see all the text clearly. The text doesn't matter. Okay, it's the spiritual eye. I'll go back here then because it's easier. The spiritual eye is less confusing. And the spiritual eye represents our individuality united with the greater reality, which is I know myself to be one with the infinite. And through the spiritual eye, I can merge with the infinite, which is what what the Sahaswara, what the seventh chakra at the top of the head represents. So when I move through this world, I, I could no long, I could no more imagine, you know, taking from another person than I would want to cut off my own hand because my sense of identification has been liberated from this egoic separateness and has been united in a, a sense of spiritual oneness with all of creation. You know, this is where stories like Sri Ramakrishna, um, when the cook in his ashram uh, beat the cat with a wooden spoon to get it out of the kitchen, Ramakrishna, the welts appeared on his back. And the cook was appalled when he saw the welts on the back of Ramakrishna. But Ramakrishna said, well, when you beat the cat, you beat me. I mean, so much so that he could manifest on his body the, uh, the results of action taken against another physical body because his consciousness was everywhere. Yogananda described when toward the end of his life he was walking with Swami Kriyananda and he stumbled a little bit, uh, Yogananda did. And Swamiji had to hold him up and Master said, I'm in so many bodies, I sometimes forget which one I'm supposed to keep moving. He said, I have to ask other people if I've eaten or not because he just was everywhere. If you ate, maybe he did also. And, and he just couldn't figure out among all the arms and legs that he was inhabiting which ones he was supposed to be individually responsible for. This is the spiritual level. And the earth chakra, by contrast, represents, um, as I was saying, complete indifference to everyone but oneself. I'm going to put now the picture a little differently. So we have a spectrum. Let's call it a spectrum between complete spiritual understanding, and we'll just make this kind of a blob like that, and complete separation from higher spiritual truths. Now, I have to put a caveat in here that each of the chakras serves a divine purpose as well, but I'm not talking about that right now. I'm talking about the choices that we can make between being completely separate or completely unified with reality itself, with the greater reality. Now, every time you have a thought, an attitude, an action, a decision in your life, in my life, that response to life falls somewhere on this spectrum, somewhere between the sense of being totally separate taking care of myself, and that being the only way to happiness, and this idea that I am part of a greater reality, and and there's no way that I can move in this world without being connected to that whole. So if, for example, someone, let's use a a simple example of driving in a car, which most of us do, 
and somebody does something really um, threatening to you. When I was in India not too long ago, mostly I'm, I don't drive myself, of course it's the wrong side of the road among other things, among a thousand other things, but um, I'm usually pretty relaxed with the traffic pattern. I just figure that people know what they're doing and my life is in God's hands. But I'm not immune to um, identification with the body and anxiety about what might happen to it. And we were just going along and somehow the driver was really unconscious. And he, in a big car, was just coming right at us like this. Big one, and he was in a, one of the bigger cars and we were one of the little ones. He was just coming right at us with a lot of speed. And I looked up and I saw him and my immediate response was not one of unity. Oh, well, here I'm going to just give up my body and merge into the infinite, which it's quite possible to feel that way even in the face of a physical threat or physical death. Um, there's the story in Autobiography of a Yogi of the uh, sadhu that the police mistook for a violent criminal and when the sadhu did not respond to their command to stop, the overzealous policeman took his machete and sliced off the arm of the sadhu. The sadhu didn't even flinch. He just calmly picked up his arm, reattached it, and by his miraculous healing powers, it was perfectly fine, and then calmly said to the policeman, I'm not the man you're seeking. There was no... His sense of unity with the greater reality was so fixed in his consciousness that even the, the attack on his body didn't cause him to separate from that greater reality enough to defend it or even to respond to the pain that an ordinary person would feel. Now, I'm in this car and all of a sudden this big uh, thing is coming at me and my response was the most natural response in the world. <gasps> like that. You know, just this complete sense of tension which expressed itself as not a, not a hysterical cry but a definite cry. And, of course, just in that moment, the driver became conscious, too, and went around us. But that, uh, in a moment of crisis, concern for my physical body, identification with it, concern about pain, is an indication of where my consciousness is. And if somebody insults you and treats you very rudely and says, well, that was a really crummy piece of work, and your first response is, yes, and it was good. You, what do you know what you're talking about? Who are you to talk to me like that? How dare you? Or, and nobody ever really appreciates what I do. You know, I'm really so good and so sincere, and nobody appreciates me. All of these indicate a certain level of consciousness, a certain definition of reality that is not philosophical, but is simply where we vibrate. You know, if somebody punches you and your first response is to hit them back, if somebody is really mean to you and your first response is to be mean back to them. I uh, had this experience when my husband David and I were traveling in a motorhome. This was many years ago. And the motorhome was large enough to have a separate kitchen in the back. It was a, really this great moving house. It was fabulous. And David was driving, we were driving on a mountainy road, and he, he, drew, his, the, he let the car drift a little and he made a rather sharp turn to get back into the lane where he needed to be. I was in the back and I had a one pound peanut butter jar. And I was, had it open and I, I had just pulled it off the shelf actually, it wasn't open. I was making a sandwich. And when he made that sharp turn, it slid right off the counter and hit my foot. Fortunately, it didn't do any real damage at all. But the impact of that peanut butter jar on my foot, especially unexpectedly, 